This is Joe Maciars from A Tutoring Enterprises with another Apple Grapher math video. Uh, today I want to continue with the graphing of rational functions. I promised that we were going to look at some examples. This is that first example. Uh, it's going to be y equals the quantity x plus 3 over the quantities 2x plus 3 times x minus 1. A uh, quick little plug for my business. Uh, I'm an online tutor and in-person tutor. Uh, that tutors in physics, math, chemistry, and engineering. I've been doing that for about 20 years. Uh, there's all my contact information. I'll show this all again at the end of the video as well. All right, so let's get on to talking about graphing rational functions and specifically graphing this particular example. You know, I've got a, uh, a particular book that I'm looking at, and this is the uh, a PDF in Adobe Acrobat, and uh, we're going to be looking at this number 12 uh, problem here. Uh, one of the first things you want to do when you have the, uh, an equation like this is you want to break it down. Now this one's already broken down for us into the binomial factors and this tells us quite a bit of information. Uh, what I suggest you do before you actually start to sketch this out, sketch this graph out, is to actually write down some of the information and think about a little bit about what it means. Alright, so I'm going to just click into this area and make myself a little bookmark just to show you some of the things that I would write down myself. One of the first things that I tend to look at is the bottom right off the bat. I look at the vertical asymptotes and we'll call those vertical asymptotes and we have two of those. We're going to have one at, uh, in fact let me show you how to solve that. Basically if you set 2x plus 3 equal to 0 and solve this that is move the 3 across the equal sign, you'll get 2x equals negative 3 and then divide both sides by 2 or slide the 2 underneath the negative 3. Either way you get x equals negative 3 halves and this is one of our vertical asymptotes. It also has a multiplicity oops, of 1. Okay, And what that means is there's an exponent of 1 here. I want to get out of that little magnifying glass because it'll have a tendency to actually click on it and uh, then I'll be zooming in and out. Uh, this has an exponent of 1 so this is our multiplicity. The same thing is true for the x minus 1 and the x plus 3. Okay so let me go ahead and get rid of the calculations for that now. We're just going to summarize the fact that the first one, the first uh, vertical asymptote occurs at x equals negative 3 halves and it has a multiplicity of 1. Now, what does that mean? That means that it's going to go off, uh, one branch will go up while the other branch will go down. It'll go in different directions as you approach the vertical asymptote from different directions. We'll show you what that show, comes up to be when we actually do the graphing. There is another vertical asymptote, and that's coming from this factor. If you solve this, this is trivial, you basically set it equal to zero, move the negative one across, you're going to get x equals one. So this is another vertical asymptote that and then its multiplicity is also equal to 1. So we're going to have two different vertical asymptotes. All right, what's next? Well, typically I'll look at the top of an equation. And the top of the equation, when, where, whatever makes that 0, is an x-intercept. So if we set x plus 3 equal to 0 and move the 3 across, we get x equals negative 3. I'm kind of jumping ahead of myself, so let me say x-intercepts. And here we're only going to have one of them. It's x equals negative 3. And it also has a multiplicity equal to 1. Now for an x-intercept, the multiplicity of 1 tells us whether it passes through the x-intercept or whether it just touches the x-intercept, just touches the x-axis. In this case, a multiplicity, uh, an odd multiplicity, tells us it's actually going to pass through. Now it could go through in this sort of direction or in this sort of direction. That we don't know. We can't tell that from the multiplicity, but we can tell that it passes through. All right, so let's put that over there. The next thing I would talk about generically is holes. Now actually when I look at this I know that there are no holes. And why? Well, there are no holes because you'd have to have the same factor in both the top and the bottom. And this is close. Had this been a 2 or this 2 had not been there, then we would have had a hole at x equals, well, I guess it would depend upon whether the 2 was there or not. 
know, if the two is not there, the whole would be at x equals negative 3. But then we would not have a vertical asymptote any longer. Uh, we'll talk more about holes. I'll try to find a, an example that it, uh, has holes in it, and we'll talk about that when we get there. Uh, so that's it. Now, generally, when I see no holes, I don't actually usually even write this down, but for your benefit, we'll write it down. All right. So now we're also going to talk about the y-intercept, and this is pretty straightforward. As far as the y-intercept is concerned, there's two ways to look at this. You can either uh, plug 0 in for every x in the equation, or simply ignore the x's. It's equivalent. And so basically you're looking at the constants. So basically we're going to have y is equal to 3 from the top, and then on the bottom we're going to have another 3, and then times a negative 1. All right. Well, the 3's are going to cancel, and 1 over negative 1 is just equal to negative 1. So this is going to be our y-intercept. And a lot of times it's very handy to have a single point. Notice we know what that point is. We know that it's uh, x, y is equal to 0, negative 1, because that's what a y-intercept is, is, has the x equal to 0. So we're going to be plotting this point. And from this point alone, believe it or not, we can sketch out the entire graph. And have it, Now, it may not be exact, but it's going to be very close to what we, we would expect to see. Now, unfortunately, I can't sketch this out because I, right now I don't have a camera uh, that I can actually show you me doing this by hand. But I can show you what I would talk about or the way I would think about it as we do it on the infographer. Okay, one last thing to talk about, and that is the extreme end behavior. So extreme end behavior. Some people will just call this NP, end behavior. Uh, some, uh, I like to... to uh, call it extreme end behavior because sometimes there's something that I would like to call a middle behavior. We're not going to have that in this case, but uh, in some cases we want to talk about something that's kind of in between the detail. All of this stuff is kind of the detail information, and this is kind of like the overall or zoomed out information. All right, to look at that, what we're going to do is look at approximately, um, but I'm going to say equals at this point because it's closer to equals than approximate. And what we're going to do is uh, we're just imagining that the x's are getting either very big or very small in the sense of not small as in close to zero, but small as in negative infinity. So when these values get really big, basically the 3, the 3, and the negative 1 are the ones we're ignoring this time. And so what do we end up with? Well, we end up with x on top, and on the bottom we end up with 2x times another x. Now, what's going to happen? Well, the, the x on the top and one of the x's on the bottom can cancel, and that's basically going to leave us with 1 over the quantity 2x. Now, that's one way to approximate this. If I really go out to infinity, then basically what we're talking about is the bottom goes to infinity, and 1 over infinity is very close to 0. So basically, we're going to get y equals 0 as a horizontal asymptote. So that's what we get out of this. So this implies a horizontal asymptote, which I'll just call HA, of y equal 0. Okay? That's the last of our information. So let's go ahead to the uh, graphing calculator, and we're going to start to put some of this stuff in there. I'll show you what, what you do to graph this out. Okay. I'm not really in love with this coordinate system. Uh, Well, that, I like this a little better, but it's not what I would have preferred. Okay, but we'll go with this. Now, I'm not going to type in the equation right off the bat. What we're going to do is we're going to start typing in uh, the, the various information. That is the x, uh, the asymptotes, for example. So we've got x is equal to negative 3 halves, or 1.5. And so we're going to get that there. And we'll fix the, the color and the dash it and all that good stuff in a little bit. And then we also have a vertical asymptote at x equals 1. So the first thing is to put those vertical asymptotes in. Now, I'm also going to go ahead and just jump over to the horizontal asymptote. That was y equals 0. So we can put that in. And what I'm going to do is uh, highlight all three of these. And I'm just going to make them dashed lines. Now, uh, we're going to color them red and dash them. Okay. And then 
get something that looks like this. All right. Now, one of the things that's true about uh, rational polynomials is the, the curve that we're going to draw cannot pass through a vertical asymptote. Uh, so basically, these two vertical asymptotes divide the graph into basically three regions, one here, one here, and one here. The horizontal asymptote then divides those into two apiece. However, there's no restriction on a function, say, coming up and going over a horizontal asymptote and, say, for example, coming back down. All the horizontal asymptote is telling us is that when x gets really big, the function is going to approach it. Now, for the simplest of functions, it is not generally going to cross the horizontal asymptote, but you can't take that as a, you know, a solid rule. So, um, and, and there's not a, as far as I know, there's not a good way to know when it's going to cross, except that those kind of equations end up looking a lot more complicated than the ones we're dealing with here. All right. Now, there's two other things that I want, need to put in. Uh, one is an x-intercept, and one is the y-intercept. And with those two bits of information, we're going to be able to graph everything about this. Okay, now remember to do a point. We go over to a uh, parametric Cartesian curve equation and uh, basically get rid of the parametric stuff, which is all of this. Put some spaces in there. And we know that the, our x-intercept is at negative 3, which means that that's going to be negative 3, 0. Okay? And I'm going to go fix that point a little later on. I'll clean it up a little bit. Do. Uh, that's because of the why. <laughs> uh, maybe in some video I'll explain what that is, but uh, for right now we're not going to worry about it. Okay, I've just copied and pasted so I didn't have to do that whole thing with the throwing the parametric equations in. And we said that our y-intercept was going to be located at 0, negative 1. So let's put that. All right. So, now I'm claiming that with all this information, with just these two points, I can graph everything, I can, or at least sketch it, not, not necessarily graph it, but sketch it. Uh, a couple things I'm going to do first, though, is I'm going to clean up those points. I'm going to make them solid points, and we're going to go ahead and make them just a little bit smaller. Okay. All right. Now, I'm actually going to start with my y-intercept. Actually, the x-intercepts x don't help very much. So if you have a whole bunch of x-intercepts, you may think, oh, great, I've got lots of information. And you do, but it's not useful in terms of actually pinning down exactly what the graph looks like. To pin it down, you either are going to need some, some sign information, which I'm not going to go over on this particular one, uh, but or you need some other point. And usually the y-intercept is, is a good point to talk about. Uh, sometimes when you have a vertical asymptote on x equals 0, which is therefore the y-axis, you lose that y-intercept, and then you have to go, either go pick out another point or, re, or uh, come up with a different way of doing it, which I would use sine patterns. In any case, notice what we know about this. We know there are no x-intercepts in between, and we also know that there's going to have to be well, let's first explain what, what's the possibilities. Let's talk about that. Well, I could have a graph coming up from the bottom here, going through here, and then trailing itself back up this line. I could have a, gra uh, a curve coming down here, going through the y-intercept, and coming down like that. I could have a curve that starts at the top, comes down through here, crosses through the y-intercept, and then circles back up like a big U. Or I could have something that looks a little in, more n-ish and come uh, up, cross the y-intercept, and then go back down. Those are my four possibilities. That's it. That's all I can do because in the end run, I have to, the curves have to follow these lines. Which is it? Well, the knowledge that there's no x-intercepts says you can't do this. So the u-shape is out. Notice it also means that this is out because, boom, we would have to go through the x-intercept there. We have no x-intercepts there. It also outlaws this. We can't go through that point because, well, again, no x-intercepts there. So the only one that's left is a curve that's doing this. Okay? So this is where we're going to expect uh, our, our curve to be. All right. So now keep that in mind. Let's let's now picture uh, let's picture this 
asymptote right here. Okay. We now know that the curve is doing this and it's going down. Now there's some other information about this vertical asymptote we know. We know it's multiplicity. And we know what that multiplicity is. It's odd. And that tells us that if this side is going down, the other side had to be going up. So that means if we're drawing it this way, it's actually coming down towards the x-axis. Now what does it do from there? Well, you might argue, well, it can go like this and, and go down to infinity, or it could do this and then go off to infinity, or maybe it comes down through the axis and goes off to infinity. Can't do any of those things. Why? No x-intercepts. You can't go through the x-axis. So what, do you, what is the possibility? Well, you have to come down for one thing. Now, there's, there are two choices left. We can go off to infinity this way, or we can go off and start to approach horizontal asymptote, which by the way, if you have a horizontal asymptote, is exactly what you have to do. So eventually, I mean, now maybe it can come up and do some wiggly things here, but eventually it has to come down and it has to approach this. Now, this is a simplified one, a simplified equation. It's not very complicated, so it's going to end up looking just kind of like a little, well, a corner effectively, a rounded corner. So now imagine what we've got. We've got our end shape piece here, we've got our corner over here, and we've got one part of the graph left over here. What's going to happen? Okay, well, again, back in the middle, we had that N-shaped curve. So as it's approaching this vertical asymptote, it's headed downward. We also know the multiplicity for this vertical asymptote is 1, which means the other branch on the other side has to be headed up as we approach the vertical asymptote. All right, so that means we have to come down. Now, notice we've got an x-intercept, and we know it's multiplicity. So, I mean, theoretically, we could have two possibilities. We can come over, we can just touch this, come back up, and we'd have to come back down because we've got to go back to the horizontal asymptote. Or we could do this. We could go through the horizontal asymptote. Notice that would be one of the possibilities. And it would then have to turn and approach the horizontal asymptote. Now, that's the one that it has to be, because the multiplicity for the x-intercept is also odd, which means it passes through. So we now know everything. We know that this is going to come down. It's going to be corner-ish, but it's going to pass through the x-axis, turn, and then start to approach the horizontal asymptote. So let's trace it out. We've got this. We've got our n-shape, or, or inverse u-shape, right here. And then we've got a corner over here. Let's graph it and see what we get, see if we're right. Okay. And I better be, because otherwise I would redo the video, right? So, <laughs> uh, actually, I haven't done it on this one, I'll be honest with you. So, if it works, then it's great. If it doesn't work, well, then you will never see this. So, uh, but it should work. So, let's see. Boom, there it is. And it's pretty much everything we said that it was going Okay, so there it is, it's green. Let's look at it again. A couple things to note. Here's our N-ish shape curve. Notice it's not symmetrical, and, I, and part of that symmetry is broken by the fact that there's an x-intercept here. Uh, we don't have symmetry, let's say, in, on this side compared to this side. So there, you wouldn't expect symmetry over here either. Notice also the y-intercept is not the maximum of this little part. And to find out where that maximum is, well, that's where you start doing some calculus. And that's one of the reasons you would want to know how to do this, is because in calculus, they're going to ask you, what's the maximum there? Where is it located? We're not going to worry about that today. Uh, now, the other thing that's maybe a little bit, you might say, well, a little suspect, is that really turned fast. It went through. We can see that it went underneath. But boy, it really didn't get, you know, it didn't do that loopy thing that you said. Well... Some of that is a matter of, of uh, your, your scale. I'm going to show you here that we can kind of bring that detail out a little bit. And we can do that basically by reducing our y values here in the frame lengths. If we go from negative 2 to 2, we're going to basically stretch the y direction, and we're going to get to see a little bit more of 
that loop means. Now it's not really, it's actually spread out pretty far, but it's still going to eventually approach. Um, let me do a little bit more in that regard. Actually, this part's not horrible, but let me actually now go emphasize the negative part. Let me go to negative 100 10, yeah, well, let's go to 20. And then we'll let this be negative 1 1. We'll really emphasize that out. Okay, well, you can see a couple of behaviors. You, number one, you see the horizontal asymptote behavior. It's, it's approaching as we go further out. And you can see now that it's, it's kind of got that loopiness right in here. It's coming down through the x-intercept and then coming back. Um, so this is now the problem with doing it this way is that you kind of <laughs> you kind of lose your little n-shaped thing in there. It, it does kind of emphasize that the maximum is not the y-intercept, and we almost lost our y-intercept. But uh, the point is that we can see all these features by appropriate adjustments of the window. Uh, if you're doing a TI-86 or a TI-84 or 83 or something like that, adjusting your window is what you want to do to see these features. Okay. Uh, I think that's it for this video. I think you've seen a way of how to graph this. I didn't actually draw it out, but I predicted it ahead of time, and then we graphed it, and sh we saw that it basically fit all of the behaviors we were talking about. This is what the knowledge of vertical asymptotes and x-intercepts and holes and y-intercepts and the extreme end behavior, that this is what all of that stuff can tell you. You can pretty much guess what the graph looks like without ever having drawn it or detailing it, you know, without actually throwing it into a graphing calculator. Uh, of course, that's what I'm doing, but, you know, what I'm saying is we could have sketched this all out on paper. All right? Well, that's it for this example. We're going to do a few other examples along the way. Uh, let me go click on our ending screen here. I, I lost my icons. I'll turn them all on here. Okay. So th we were taking a look at y equals x plus 3 over the quantities 2x plus 3 times x minus 1. And uh, we're going to look at more examples as we move on. Okay. A uh, little plug for my business, A Tutoring Enterprise. My name is Joe Maciars. I've got a website at www.tutent.com. Uh, all kinds of good information there, like times and ma map of where I'm at. If you're interested in local tutoring, I'm in Lincoln, Nebraska. Uh, my email, phone number, all that good stuff. Uh, I do online tutoring through Skype. Uh, I'm also investigating Google Hangouts at this point, and so there's a couple of options there for that. And um, I also do in-person tutoring in Lincoln, Nebraska. Uh, I tutor in physics, math, and chemistry, and if you need some help, give me a call or shoot me an email, and we'll get something arranged and uh, get together. All right, let's uh, continue on here. Please remember to hit the like button, uh, comment, and tell me what you're thinking about the, the videos. If there's questions I can help you with, let me know. Uh, so go ahead and subscribe to get updates to all my videos. And um, if this video helped you, please feel free to donate a dollar to the, my PayPal account at uh, two tent at neb.rr.com. And uh, if uh, you'd rather just uh, get some help from me, that's even better. Uh, give me a call and let's schedule some time. All right, this is going to be a little white screen. It's going to show the, the theoretical videos we did on graphing rational functions, kind of give you the, the whys of, of how we knew the things that we knew. If you didn't, if this is your first time watching this video, you might want to go back and look at those videos. And then there's some more examples that you'll see. I'm also planning on doing a little video directory sometime in the summer of 2013. We're in, in fact, today's June 1st. Uh, the making of this video and uh, so hopefully by that point you'll be able to look at that video and if this one isn't particularly helpful for where you're at you might check out the directory and see if there's something uh, that would be more helpful to you uh, in that regard so uh, please check that out and uh, I appreciate you taking a look at this one uh, have a great day and uh, thanks